Talk and Rock Radio, where friends meet at the intersection of life, inspiration, and music. Here's your host, Rick Kern. Welcome, everyone, to Talk and Rock Radio. You know, when I think back to El Paso's early years of recording studios, several come to mind, like Steve Crosno and Bobby Fuller. There was one, however, where several of the El Paso local bands cut their teeth and their first records. One of El Paso's recording pioneers and border legend is with us today. Welcome from Birmingham, Alabama, Bill Taylor. How are you doing, buddy? Hey, thank you. I'd like to say everything I say today also includes my best friend, Kenny Smith. We did this all together. You bet, man. And he was a great one. You know, in 1961, it all began with three guys, Bill Taylor, Glenn McCain, and Bob Crockett, and they were called the Troubadours. Tell us a little bit about your folk trio, Bill. Well, the Troubadours came came down. Uh, Glenn McCain was uh, contacted and asked to do something for uh, the beauty contest at Texas Western College. And in two days, we threw together a trio and uh, practiced our songs and went and did it on the second night. And uh, we went over so good that they asked us to represent them, uh, Texas Western, in the uh, college, all college uh, contest down in Brownswood, Howard Payne University. And we went down there and won second place there. And we spent that whole year just being a uh, college trio. And were you doing cover songs or were you doing some of your own stuff then, Bill? No, at that time we were doing mostly Kingston Trio and I think they were hot at the time. Uh, you know, we did um, uh, the Sun Queen's Prom. We did um, fraternities. And, and things like that uh, throughout the college year. So we were just, uh, or we also played the Don Quixote's Coffee Shop, opened uh, up for several name groups there. Yeah, Joan Baez, we opened up for Joan Baez and, and things like that. So we had a big year doing a lot of things. You know, back in those days, you mentioned a coffee shop, but, you know, back in those days, because my wife, I know she participated, she was playing guitar and had some friends uh, like Dean Keller, different people that played boat guitar here in town. And they went to a place called, it seemed like the cellar, I think it was called the cellar. I think that might have been at one of the churches. And I know I you, so. played, you all played at Trinity United Methodist Church also, didn't you? Right, yeah, we played several churches. But like I said, Don Quixote's Coffee Shop was kind of the end thing for us. In 62, you kind of graduated from a folk trio to a uh, more or less kind of a folk rock band. Uh, that's when the Sherwoods were born, and, and you had your bandmate uh, and future business partner, Kenny Smith, that was part of that group. Uh, and, and it became Bill Taylor and the Sherwoods. Talk about that a little bit. Well, actually, I have a funny story about that. Uh, the, the Troubadours, were, I mean, excuse me, the uh, Sherwoods were already functioning, but they were pretty much a, of a, a, a instrumental group. And uh, one night I was working with the uh, charcoal. Bobby Maddox came in, who was a drummer, and he said, are you still singing with the trio? And I said, no, uh, they went off to a different, they went to Texas Tech, and uh, so I'm not singing anymore. And he said, well, you want to join my rock group? And I said, well, gee, that would be great. So he said, well, we're playing next Friday night. So it was Halloween night over at Eastwood High School. I showed up. When I got there, there was this one guy on the stage kind of putting up his amp and stuff. And I walked up on the stage and he looked at me like, who are you? And I said, uh, well, I came to sing with the group. And he said, what? So I thought that Bobby forgot to tell the group that. <laughs> so we just... Uh, so we just kind of hooked a few and said, well, you know, you know, Buddy Holly, play this. But uh, the leader of the group was Kenny Smith, and he had no idea who I was or why I was on stage with him. Well, it obviously worked. <laughs> yeah, it worked really the, well. The, yeah. the group was together for a couple of years, and uh, 
and you you did a song called "You Hold My Letters, Not Me." Now that one was written by you, right? And and I think you recorded it at Bobby Fuller's uh, Eastwood uh, Studio, that's right? right? We recorded with Bobby Fuller then. We did several records out there for him. <laughs> You're a thousand miles away When I live in a cry No argument leaving you I want you by my side Cause I'm jealous of the letters I write The strangers that may be me Cause I know that you hold it in tight You hold them all letters, not me That ain't the way it should be You hold my letters, not me uh -uh, That ain't the way it should be I know you're true to me That's why I gave you my ring But though you're true to me I'm jealous of one thing, yeah I'm jealous of the letters I write As strangers that may be Cause I know that you hold it in tight You hold them all letters, not me That ain't the way it should be You hold my letters, not me That ain't the way it should be You know, a lot of the El Paso bands uh, did recordings in that studio, and uh, it uh, put a lot of lot of bands on the map. Yeah, definitely so. He, I think he was about the first one that was really uh, open for people to come in and record with him. He even sang up background on our first record. We didn't have any background record. He said, you guys need some background. He said, it goes like this. So he told us background real quick, real quick and we put background on the record. And they do really pretty good in uh, in El Paso, Texas. Uh, it went. Uh, I sent you the little KELP survey, and the reason yes. I sent that survey to you was the survey's date was the date that uh, President Kennedy was assassinated. And we oh were wow! Number, uh, I think we were number thirteen on the charts on that date, but I kept that particular one because of the the date of it. So uh, the Sherwoods were together for about two years or so. Then we uh, kind of broke up and uh, we went, went, Kenny and I went out to Hollywood, California and around. And I went off to Vietnam. And when I came back, we, uh, I said, I want to be a country singer. And Kenny said, OK. So I was, I was a country singer for about 15 minutes. And uh, we wrote a couple of songs and recorded our first record in Kenny's basement. And incidentally, Kenny's father got kicked out of his lease because of the noise we were making downstairs. So our first studio was in Kenny's basement and our first record was Eddie Taylor, My Country. And then after that, I thought, well, maybe not. So we went back to rock and roll. And I think in 1970, you guys uh, built your new studio in the Upper Valley, right? That's true. And uh, that was kind of an amazing story. Uh, it's a story of entrepreneurship. This studio was kind of, it was a magical thing. Uh, we decided we were going to build our own studio. And uh, we uh, knew absolutely nothing about building the studio, but we took off building it. We uh, had very little money to put into it. But we started off with saying, well, we need acoustical tile. And we went out and priced it. And it was about $300 for acoustical tile. And we said, Oh, we can't afford that. The next day I'm driving through Texas Western, it was in the summertime, and there's a huge pile of acoustical tile out on the lawn, and they were refurbishing the uh, the student union building and was tearing out all the tile and throwing it down. So I got down and I said, uh, I called a guy, said, is, is your foreman around? And he said, yeah, that guy was there. And I said, hey, could I have some of this tile? He said, you can have as much of it as you want. You just got to get rid of it before the weekend because we're hauling it on Monday morning. So Kenny and I made three trips in a station wagon, got all of our tile for no cost. There you go. <laughs> well, that was that was meant to happen. 
Well, that was step one. Yeah, well, it was meant to happen. Step two was uh, we were looking for recording equipment, which we couldn't afford to buy professional stuff. And we went down to Howell uh, Electronics and uh, all the stuff that we wanted were uh, was up in the thousands. And so I said, can, can we speak to the owner? And Mr. Howell came down and I said, do you have any used equipment, you know? And he said, yeah, I said, come on in the back. And so we go back in the storeroom and it turns out a radio station had traded in their old three track recorder to get a new four track recorder. So he said, you can have this. And I said, hey, here's the deal. Let's, we're we're going to make uh, uh, commercials and uh, record bands and stuff like that. How's about letting us take this equipment and uh, when we make the money, we'll pay you for it. And he said, yeah, take it. Here, take this four track, I mean, this eight track mixer along with it. Here's a couple of mic stands. And he just gave us all of our equipment. And there we were. Wow. That's... That cost us nothing. nothing. Now, here's wow, that's cool, one. man. That is. Here's the best one that'll blow your mind. So we have all this equipment sitting in one room. We have the acoustical tile in the other. And Kenny and I go to the end across the road. Uh, and we're eating lunch over there talking about how we might wire the studio up how we're going to wire the earphones and stuff like that and this kid comes over to us and said said sorry i i didn't mean to to eavesdrop on you guys but i heard you talking about uh building a studio and the kid was from hilo hawaii three thousand miles away he was sent if he went in the army they sent him to uh fort bliss he just happened on that day to be on the total other town in the upper valley, just looking around, stopped in this front to eat Mexican food, was sitting next to the table next to us, and he wanted to know if he could help us put together our studio. Wow. This guy was a professional engineer. So <laughs> we say, yeah, you can help us, man. So now we had a professional studio. We had our two A7s that we bought from... Uh, Bobby Fuller, we had all the equipment, and we had a guy that knew how to wire everything up for us. So, Man, the stars were lined up properly for you guys. They were lined up, and now, now when we finally get it done, it's like this was using one half inch tape, and uh, we would, went out and priced that. The, the kid uh, named Charles Finch, he shows up on a Saturday with 40 boxes of tape that the army had, was using for computer stuff that was recorded on quarter inch tape. And all we had to do is erase all the blips and we had 40 boxes of tape, no charge. <laughs> wow. So it was almost- That like, is too it cool. Was just, just given to us. You, uh, you guys worked with a lot of El Paso bands. In fact, I think during that time that, that uh, Sumi Records was going on, you guys uh, had, what, around 15 singles or something that you did? Yes, we had that. And, of course, we recorded lots of other things, uh, commercials and things, too. But we had about 15 singles. And uh, then we decided to do one album, which we did with three different groups. Let's talk about the other groups that you worked with there. I know the Sojourners were one of them, and and uh, go Scavenger, ahead and tell us uh, about some of the other groups. The Wild Ones. Uh, our best guy was Lou Pride. Uh, he was uh, Lou Pride was a soul singer. He was with a band called the Groove Merchants. I thought that was the coolest name. So we recorded a song on him called "I'm Coming Home in the Morning." And I have a little story about that later on that'll tell you about what that song, that song turned out to be launched him over England. me she was feeling bad she didn't know what to do 
She was all alone, wanted me to come home. She was feeling sad. Let me tell you, baby, I'm coming home in the morning. Yes, I will. I'm coming home in the morning. Right on, baby. Yes, I will I wrote my baby specialty And just told her I didn't know her love was that strong If she had just a little patience, baby I was surely coming home And I'm coming home in the morning Oh, yes, I will I A recording of that. And well, I'll go ahead and tell the story right now if it's okay. Uh, we found out that they, at that time, people would come over from England and bootleg records. They would go around and find local records they liked. They would take it back to England, make a copy of it, put the record out. If it sold, they made money. If it didn't sell, it didn't cost them a thing. And of course, we got no royalties or anything like that. But they went to number five on the charts over in England. So that was the least we learned that we could make a hit record. And it was stolen from us. Okay, and then you also had, uh, you had worked with Hugh Presswood in, in the Medicine Band, and uh, in fact, your girlfriend, Karen Burke, was in that group. Uh, yes, well, we, the thing was, is we, after a while with Toomey Records, we recorded ourselves, we recorded the Gorgo album, and uh, Kenny and I got to talking, I said, you know, we're, we're pretty much not in the mainstream in the music business. I think maybe I should move to Memphis, Tennessee, where my uncle Liz, who was instrumental in getting Elvis his contract and owning a uh, big record distributors up there. I said, let me go to Memphis, see what I got shaking, Kenny, and you stay, stay here and record whatever you can and send me anything that you think is good. Okay, so let's uh, let's talk a little bit about, Bill, the, uh, the El I Love You Gorgo album. I know that was a, a big project for Sumi Records here in El Paso. Um, I think there was what three groups that played on that on that album, right? We got the Truth, we had the Intruders, and we had Lodestar. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about that album? Yeah, they were three groups that had come out and recorded in our studio, and we liked them, so we decided we would like to do our first album and use three different groups, each group being able to do four songs. So those were the three groups that we uh, chose: Lodestar. And uh, Lodestar went on later to become another group that we'll talk about uh, when we went to Memphis. So we recorded three groups, and we also put a single out of each one of those groups off of the album. And uh, really kind of enjoyed it. We, we were hawking in Texas Western into college, you know, and, 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 and their bands where they were playing at nights, you know. One of the groups that uh, I know was... Uh being managed by Charlie Beatsworth was a group called Truth. And uh, I know one of the songs they did is It's a Nice Day, Isn't It? And uh, you want to talk a little bit about that song? Oh, yeah. Kenny and I both really liked that song. We thought, this is great. So it was the first thing that made us think, let's put out a single on that. And uh, they changed their name from Truth to Liberty. So the song was put out uh, uh, on the single called Liberty of Teach with the group. And uh, it, it was just a great song. We really liked it. It was one of our favorites. Boy with his girl I can remember when I first got 
the intruders of course rod crosby uh there was one of his songs that i i really like called petition melody you want to talk a little about that song right that was uh also a song off the album that we turned into a single uh at that time uh rod was calling himself uh, crosby's closet so we released a single of Patricia Melody, right? And it was Crosby's Cause that became one of our singles that we put out. You know, all of these songs we were rushed down to KELP and see if we couldn't get them played. The Lodestar Band, uh, Bottom of the Hill. I know that was a song that we really liked, too. Right. We made a single of that and put it out. And uh, it did pretty good for us in El Paso, Texas. So we sold a few records there.
1972, I know that's about the time that you decided to pull up roots and, and uh, move to Memphis. Uh, you and Karen, not only was she your girlfriend, you ended up marrying her. What year did you guys get married? Oh, golly. I wish you hadn't asked that. That, would been, <laughs> that was later on. <laughs> that was later on. See, the, the thing is, when I moved to uh, Memphis, we had I had not heard the medicine pen yet. Kenny was stayed in El Paso, Texas, re- using our studio Tasmid Records uh, to record, and he recorded some stuff on the medicine band. <laughs> and he sent me the tapes and I just I thought this guy is a great songwriter and their girl singer was called uh, Karen Burke and so I said Kenny send send those guys up here to Memphis and come up with them and let's record something to see if we can't get get a record deal for them up here so I didn't marry uh, a couple of years later yeah and uh I know you had some good success with with uh, Hugh Presswood and those guys doing uh, what Louisiana Woman and and several songs that they did on that album it was really good album. Uh, there's another group that you all recorded there that was an, well they were I think all of the groups that you recorded in Memphis when you were working at uh, at Royal and High uh, Studios was uh, they were all El Paso groups pretty much weren't they except for the I think the very last group. But uh, but they were all pretty much El Paso groups, right? Uh, yeah. First of all, I got to tell you the, the the deal. So I went to Memphis looking around. What can I get going for for Kenny and I up there for Sumi Records? Incidentally, Sumi uh, means if you don't like it, Sumi. So that's what we came <laughs> up with the name. So anyway, I went to, to Memphis and I got into High Records as their studio manager. And from there, uh, I worked a deal. And, I, and the deal was this, you think you love it. They had national distribution. So my deal was, we'll bring bands in, record them. If you like it, they had first refusal. If you like the band, you get to put them on high records. If you don't like the band, we get to keep them and shop them someplace else. So I'm sitting in Memphis with the Royal Recording Studio, which is a... Uh, half a million dollar or more studio with the idea that when high records wasn't recorded there, I could do anything in that studio I wanted to. So I could record anything. We uh, And so, of course, we were always after midnight recording, but when the high records wasn't used in the studio, we could use it. And so we began to bring in the groups that we wanted to record. And obviously, uh, all of our uh, thoughts and bands came from El Paso, Texas. Uh, Lodestar, which was on the uh, I Love You Go Go album, had changed their name to Swift Rain when they uh, added a second guitar player there. Their thing was Harmony Guitar, and they were they were cool. 
that was the first band we brought in there. We got a deal for them and got them a record out, uh, an album uh, distributed by London Records out of New York. And uh, they were our first success. And then we recorded the Medicine Band because uh, Kenny had recorded them and sent their tape up to me. Another group that you recorded, uh, and I really like this band too, uh, never got a chance to see them in person, but I really liked their music, and that was called Iota. Oh, they were a great little band. Listen, it was the same thing. Kenny uh, recorded them in El Paso, sent me their tape, and I said, that's great. Send them up and, and come up with them, and we'll record them here in Memphis. And uh, they showed up uh, in a... In a rented, uh, excuse me, uh, a used school bus. And they lived in their school bus and uh, came out and parked out behind a, a friend of mine's house for a week as we recorded all of their stuff. <laughs> Yeah, the song I'm playing is called Glimpses, and it's really a, it's a hot song, man. I really was impressed with these guys. Yeah, they were they were a good band. We got a single out on them. I think it was called R.I.P. Rest in Peace was a single that was put out on High Records, and uh, so High Records picked them up as well as the uh, Swift Train. Now they passed on New Prime. We Excuse me, go ahead. No, go ahead, man. I'm going to say Lou Pride, when we brought him up, uh, I, I knew they wouldn't pick up on them because they already had a, uh, a whole bunch of R&B acts. So we loved Lou, so we recorded him. I, I knew they would refuse it, and then we could go shop him someplace else. So when uh, Kenny came up, we recorded Lou Pride, uh, and uh, we just had a blast, you know, Swift Rain, we must have spent a year in the studio one week. We drank a case of <laughs> Boone Farm strawberry wine and just recorded from midnight till 6 o'clock in the morning every night for a week. <laughs> and those guys could put the wine away, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> well, you had a good run in Memphis for about seven years, and then... Uh, of course, during that time, you know, you're you're still working with Karen some, and uh, you and, and Karen decided to uh, move on to Nashville and promote Karen, and, and she was really getting big into the country riding. So I want to talk a little about that. Oh, well, yeah, this was uh, after we had our run at uh, High Records. Uh, High Records sold them to another label called Cream Records out of California. And when Cream took over, they were very interested in uh, Kenny and I. So we just decided it was time to move on. And uh, at that time, I married had married Karen Burke, and she became Karen Taylor. And the two of us moved to Nashville to start her country career. Hers lasted for more than 15 minutes. We had, uh, <laughs> yeah. So she became, uh, we did quite... 
we we did uh, we, well i gotta tell you the story about that uh, you know first of all i took the recordings that we had uh, a song that i recorded called diamond and rough on karen took it to every major label in town and everyone them passed them by and she was heartbroken and i said you know karen when the big boys won't let you play in their game the only thing you can do is start your own game well, I said, let's start our own label and put it out anyway. So we started a record company called Mesa Records, Karen and I. Well, he don't dress like a downtown city dandy. He don't talk like a lawyer on a case. He can't sing a song like Kenny Rogers. Hollywood's not looking for his face But I don't care what he's not Cause he's solid like a rock And he works hard like a man That's enough Well, he's not sparkling or witty And he sure isn't pretty But then, neither is a diamond in the rough And my man is a diamond in the And the way he is, well, I guess he never will. But I don't care what he ain't got, cause he's solid like a rock. And he works hard like a man, that's enough. Well, he's not sparkling or witty, and he sure isn't pretty. But then, neither is a diamond in the rug. Yeah, I don't care what he's not, cause he's solid like a and he works hard like a man, that's enough Well, he's not sparkling or witty And he sure isn't pretty But then, neither is a diamond in the rug And you know, my man is a diamond first uh, single that everybody had turned down went top 40 uh, on country. I, I think it became for 38, right? Right. So uh, she hadn't started, most of our writing at that time was just writing for Karen. And uh, I won't say I taught Karen to write, but I, I kind of got her into writing and said, what do you want to say? Let me help you say it. And we would write our songs together and then record them. But we had 10 nationally charted singles and a nationally charted album on Karen uh, on our own independent uh, record company. Not only did you have 10 charted, but one of them that I know of, How Can I Help You Say Goodbye, was a number one for Patty Loveless, right? That's true. That was our, one of Karen's songs that she had written. By that time, she was really writing on her own and doing good things. And she had uh, several uh, number one records as a country songwriter. Also, Hugh Prestwood was a superstar as a writer. He wrote more charted records than I could shake a stick at. He went on to become really big uh, country songwriter. Yeah, he's a, he's a great writer. And um, in fact, I've done a show with him. We're going to be doing another one when he finishes his, his move back to Texas. Um, I've got a really cool photo of you uh, sitting behind the the board with uh, with Wayne Moss at Cinderella Records. You want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, Cinderella, when we moved to uh, Nashville, of course, we didn't have a free studio like we had in Memphis, so we had to rent a studio. And uh, I got in contact with this guy, Wayne Moss, and we just hit it off. He was a great guy, and he owned his studio out in the back. And uh, we recorded with him. Uh, you know, Wayne Moss was, was the, the number one premier country songwriter, uh, excuse me, guitar player. Uh, Roy Overson, down, 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 you know, Pretty Woman, things like that. Uh, most of you have heard Wayne Moss probably dozens of times and just didn't know it was him. But he was a great guitar player. 
And Wayne and I just became the best of friends and we recorded all of our Mesa records out there with him. Is he still working? Is he still going strong, Bill? Last I heard he was, he's still still singing and uh, and re and recording in his studio out the back of uh, back of his house. There's a there's a really cool video of you and this is of course after you and Karen had divorced uh but still remain close dear friends uh to this day and there's a really cool video of you and and Karen and uh and her current husband Dennis um in the name of the song is we just got to dance you now i think that that charted at number 54 right all uh, right yeah i think it was as, as far as it went uh you know mesa records have, i have several karens i like stories about karen that i like to tell and that was one uh what uh, what i realized was people love to be people want to play in a game somewhere and they don't know where to go so if you just get them going in the right direction i could talk anybody into anything so we i i talked them into uh getting the uh uh the club, you know, one night so that we could shoot our video in there. I, I got them to uh, oh, uh, on that one there, and I was saying we didn't have any money, and we were both, every time we put out a record, we were going up against the majors that had a budget of a hundred thousand dollars for a single. We had ten, so the question is, is how can we compete with those guys? So uh, I read an article that uh, about. Uh, Steven Spielberg get $100,000 off of Reese's Pieces uh, to have E.T. eat Reese's Pieces in his movie. So they took the idea to M&M's and M&M's turned them down and they went to Reese's. Reese's took them up on them. So they had E.T. following a little trail of, of uh, Reese's Pieces. And you did you know that when the sale of their uh, Reese's Pieces went up 30% that uh, movie was released. So wow. I said, you know, that's a good idea. How can we do that? So I read an article that said uh, Coors Light was trying to, to get a hold of the female artist, uh, female, excuse me, female uh, drinking age, you know. So I said, we're shooting this video. I called uh, uh, Coors Light and I said, look, we're shooting a video a dance video with a bunch of beautiful girls in it. And I said, how's about we have uh, put up, the, we'll put up some Coors Light signs and stuff like that. And I said, if you'll pay for our video, uh, we'll make sure that Coors Light gets known by it. I said, it's going to be a, a little, uh, uh, you know, we won't mention Coors Light, but we'll just show their sign about it. So I got them to pet up all the money to shoot the video. I got a, uh, a, a jukebox company to bring a jukebox out. We put every every label on the jukebox that we just got a dance Karen Taylor good. At the first they showed, you know, this is all the songs. So her only choice was we just got to dance and then went into the dancing. So we got the, uh, the, the, the club. We got uh, uh, all of our expenses paid for by Coors Light. Oh, and that Coors Light showed up with two kegs of Coors Light beer. So we sat there all day shooting this video, drinking Coors Light beer, and they brought a box of T-shirt, box of Coors Light mugs, and handed them out to everybody. And uh, we just had a high old time on their book.
<laughs> and made our video. And it was funny. And, and you're, a, you're a nerd that falls down during the film. I mean, during the dancing. I love that. <laughs> that was me. That was my role. It was podcasting. <laughs> oh, that's that was great. I I I love that video, man. It's a lot of fun. There's an acapella song called Tenderness Plays that Karen uh, did. It was written by Henley and Mathis, and uh, it's really a cool little song. I don't think I've ever heard an acapella country song that was only a minute and a half long. It was a, uh, it's kind of cool. You know? I'm going to find me a place to lay down in and let my heart rest. I think it's best that I don't see him anymore. He'll hurt like it did before I know for sure there's gotta be some place somewhere to erase the thought of him I gotta find me a soft nest I can let my heart rest in well I lay down among the flowers for hours and hours and the showers just drove me away hey do you know where I can find peace of mind for a time a kind of a tenderness place a space that's just naturally made for me, just big enough for my love. I gotta find me a soft nest I can let my heart rest in. Well, I lay down among the flowers for hours and hours, and the showers just drove me away. Hey, do you know where I can find peace of mind for a time, a kind of a tenderness place? A space that's just naturally made for me, just big enough. For my love, I gotta find me a soft nest. I can let my heart rest in. Well, everything we did was, I look at Karen, I'm saying, we can't, how are we gonna compete with the majors? You know, uh, so when we had our first record, it went top 40 and we went, I uh, got an award for being the best new producer, best new artist for country music by CSAC. And they had this show called the New, Fa new Faces Show. Uh, every year they bring in all the country jobs. They have a show that's uh, is the new artist of the year performing on there. And I said, Karen, when we go on, we've got to do something different if we're going to be noticed. Well, I came across that song and I said, let's do this song. We gathered up eight of the, um, I mean, excuse me, yeah, eight of her uh, singers that were doing jingles with her and went out and did the uh, New Faces show and just blew them away because they'd never heard anything like that. And it went over so well and was so well received. I said, well, we got to put out the record on that. So two days later, we went and recorded it in the studio and it was, uh, I think it was about our fourth single. It was on the Air, uh, United Airlines and Everybody used that thing, but it was it came to us because we didn't have enough money to record anything else, and we could get her eight friends for free. You know. Did she approach these guys uh, that wrote that song, Henley and Mathis, to uh, to record their song, or how did that work? No, I uh, approached them. I see. I approached them and said, "We'd like to do your song as an on the new face on the showcase, so that I, see. I could see her." So uh, that's what started that. Cool. Uh, another thing is entrepreneur. Let me tell you, if you don't have money, you just have to use your creativity. And uh, so lean, lean toward your strengths. So Karen was a jingle singer as well and making pretty good money as jingle singer. And uh, we were... Uh, saying the second year around Christmas came up three months before Christmas. And uh, I said, you know, how can we compete with the major labels who are given uh, all these disc jockeys, boxes of records, boxes of t-shirts, belt buckles, hats, all that sort of stuff. I said, we can't afford to send them anything like that. So I said, but you know what we could do is we could make a jingle and uh, for them. So we wrote a song called The Sights and the Sounds of December. So let's get beyond Christmas. And we recorded it and sent it to every one of the radio stations uh, as a freebie. And it was a beautiful thing. And it was recorded as a donut, as you know, which is 
the song and then there's a little donut place to where they can put in there. And I told, I, I had our promotion people tell them, you can use this jingle any way you want to use it, you can. So some guys sold it to a, a, a jewelry store and made a Christmas commercial for them on the sites and the sounds of December. And we made lots of friends with lots of uh, uh, disc jockeys by sending them this thing. It would have cost them, uh, you know, fifteen, sixteen hundred dollars to record something like that for their studio, and we did it for them for free. Very cool. So, any other stories you want to share about about Karen? Oh golly, there were so many things. Let me, no, I think I really covered it. You know, like I said, our first year we did get the best new producer and uh, and uh, uh, on singer. The, the, the one last thing I would like to say about this uh, uh, one that we did uh, with the uh, We Just Got a Dance Coors Light put us on the front page on the cover of Billboard magazine was a story about how Mesa Records had gotten a sponsor to do their video. And I'll tell you, the whole town of Nashville started chasing after trying to get people to, to do theirs. And they were following us by that time. We were showing oh, that's cool. Time. Very cool. In 2009, that was the very first year that, that Rod Crosby and I started the Border Legends of El Paso annual concert. And I had reached out to Karen and uh, had asked her if she would consider coming from Nashville to El Paso to uh, be our, our MC for the show. And she gladly accepted to do it. But not only that, we got a package deal. We got her ex-husband to come in and play with his man, the Sherwood. And uh, what a fun thing it was to have both of you guys here at our very first Board Legends show. It was a, it was quite a night. Yes, it was. Uh, actually, uh, Kenny had arranged to have the Sherwood play uh, on this border show. Uh, I think uh, the the uh, what was her name? Uh, not the Troubadours. The uh, Sojourners were there. The Sherwoods were there. Karen was there. That was after her big number one hit. Uh, she emceed the show, and it was a full circle. It kind of brought Sumi Records and our people back into the same place at the same time, and it was a, a, a big reunion for all of us. Our Swift Rain was there. But they also played. During yeah, it was a it was a exciting night. We had a lot of a lot of fun. I think we had probably about three or four hundred people there uh, at the Lancers East. It was a packed crowd, and uh, and everybody at the very end wanted to see us do it again, and so we did. We did it for another seven years after that. What was kind of fun for that very first Board Legend show that we did, we had a uh, a jam session that we had set up uh, out at Dalton Powell's house the next day on on Sunday, we had Rod Crosby had brought in a full stage, a full PA, everything. We had all the equipment, everything there, and the bands that wanted to, uh, they got to come back. Oh, I mean, over to Dalton House for the for that afternoon. Uh, we had food and drink and and just a lot of good music, and it gave us all an opportunity to play together, which was. Uh, really exciting, you know, for the musicians to play with you know each other when they never played together before, and uh, and then some of the actual bands that played the night before played too. I know, but uh, it was a lot of fun, and I know one of the special moments was when Karen and Patty Tiscareño, uh, she was the second chick singer that sang with Madison Ann after Karen left El Paso and it was pretty cool because the two girls got up on stage and sang Dream together and uh, and that was really cool. Yeah, we had a great time. It was good food and good music and uh, we just really enjoyed ourselves and appreciated all the efforts that you and Rod had gone through to put all this together. It was a, it was a, a godsend for all of us. See you 
you bill it was uh it was a pleasure to do that you know it it's uh the whole purpose in doing the border legends concept was to keep the music alive and to keep the memories of the bands alive and that's why we did it as long as we did you know we uh we miss rod tremendously we just lost him and uh it's he and i were already talking about doing a return of border legends number nine and uh but uh you know we'll have to we'll have to do it on the next stage when we're all there together you know but um, yeah. anyway well, but we we uh enjoyed doing that as long as we did it yeah you know back all the way back to uh as a recording studio we recorded sonny farlow uh a bunch of el paso guys that, that we never did get any records going for them yeah well el paso's been blessed with really good talent great musicians that you know some of them went on and and left el paso and and did big things and and uh you know we may be out here in the sticks of west texas but we uh we know how to produce great musicians and great music and uh well my friend this is uh kind of coming to the end of our interview um I really appreciate you coming on with me and doing this show, Bill. You know, going down memory lane a little bit and talking about the old days. And and uh, you were an important part of the El Paso, you know, music scene and, and everything that went on. I mean, it's uh, it, I really appreciate you being a part of it and being a part of our of our uh, talking, you know, talking rock program. You know, it was great to have you. Yeah, El Paso is the birth of my uh, music career, and I love El Paso, Texas, still do. And, uh, of course, Kenny was from El Paso, Texas, and uh, we just uh, hung out with El Paso as long as we could. Yeah, well, well my friend, I'm going to let you go. Thank you for being a part of the show, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll stay in touch, okay? You betcha. You take care of yourself. You too, my friend, and uh, we'll talk to you real soon. All right. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye now.